This lecture covers a more complicated example of the stiff spring approximation um, on a fun little system. Um, first of all, I just pasted these equations in from EMA 542. Um, again, this equation lets you calculate the velocity of point P if you know the velocity of point O, O prime it's called here actually. And that's uh, the velocity of point O plus any relative motion. And then um, for a rigid body, this term would be zero. And then omega cross R, or a position vector from P to O. Um, so anyway, I've mentioned that before, but we'll use that again. And if, you, if these don't look familiar to you, you should have something in your notes from 202 that's uh, better. All right, so a fun little example today. Um, imagine we have the space shuttle rolling out to the launch pad. It rolls out on this enormous crawler system. And um, as it's going there, the motion can induce dynamics that cause the shuttle to uh, vibrate, to move back and forth. That vibration can actually be large enough that you can have you know, visible motions. Um, I've seen videos where there's several feet of deflection of the tail fin here. And um, you would think that how can this be anything compared to the forces it's going to feel during flight? They are way, way smaller, but this roll, this drive to the pad takes on the order of eight hours. So there can be a significant amount of fatigue damage happen um, in that trip, trip to the launch pad. Well, anyway, that was the shuttle. Um, give you an idea of scale. This is the crawler. This is a buddy of mine who used to work at Sandia Labs going out to do some testing. And uh, so this is an enormous vehicle. I think they calculated the um, gas mileage that it gets on the drive to the pad. It's something like 50 feet per gallon. So crazy, crazy uh, structure. Um, Unless you say that this problem's out of date because we're um, now building a new system, the new space launch system will actually use the same crawler, only they've added this tower to hold it up. And, um, uh, but this same uh, platform basically sits on the old um, crawlers that we just saw. And um, there's various um, cables and things attached, but uh, most of the load comes through this little, um, this little arm right here. And so anyway, if we wanna make this into something simple enough that we can do it in this class, um, we could draw it uh, like this. So we'd have um, the crawler, here and let's suppose its mass is m1 and it's rolling along it's free to roll in this example in reality it's driven by motors here we'll model it as free to roll with an external force really the force comes through those motors but it's about the same thing um, and then let's suppose the space launch system is this uh, bar We'll treat it as pin down here. In reality, there is um, the supports at the bottom do provide some stiffness that will want to keep that from falling over. But most of that's probably going to come um, from the vertical support. And we'll model that with a spring just on a diagonal like this, just to make the problem pedagogically interesting. Um, so anyway, this would be the mass of the rocket. Um, its center of mass, we'll just, we'll treat it as a uniform bar. And so we have the mobile launcher, the rocket on a pin, and just one spring. And we'll find the equations of motion using the power balance method. Um, so we can immediately just begin to write the kinetic and potential energy expressions. Um, Potential energy is especially easy, just one half K delta squared, but we're going to have to go through the stiff spring approximation to work out what delta is. Um, we'll neglect gravity stiffness because for a structure like this, it's negligible compared to the actual stiffness of the steel structures. Um, and then the kinetic energy, um, we have two bodies, so we need the kinetic energy for each. For this bottom cart, it's just one half um, 
m1x dot squared. So that's easy. We said that x was the coordinate for the card. For um, the bar, we have to be careful. This bar is not, it's pinned at its end, but the end is moving. So it's not really a pinned bar. So we have to go back to our most general equation for um, kinetic energy, which says it's the velocity of the center of gravity or center of mass, uh, 1 half m times that velocity dotted into itself, plus 1 half theta times the inertia about the center of gravity or center of mass times theta dot squared. So we have to use that general equation. We'll see down below what happens if we don't. And then uh, the only other thing we have is power input from the force. And so we take the velocity of the point where the force is applied, which is just x dot in the lateral direction. And um, so we're using um, i this way and j this way. And we multiply that by the force, which is also a vector in the lateral direction. And so when we multiply those together, they're both in the same direction, so the i's cancel, and we get a scalar that's just um, the force times x dot. Okay, so um, the only things that are maybe a little tricky about this problem, we need to find the velocity of the center of mass. And so we do that using those equations I just gave. Um, point C and point G are on the same rigid body, so there's no relative velocity. So the velocity of point G is just whatever point C is plus omega cross R. And um, now we've started to do enough of these that we know that the omega cross R is just going to give us a term in this direction that's L over 2 theta dot. So we can just write out that, that we have an x dot I from point C this is VC, and then we have this negative um, L over 2 theta dot because that's, that velocity from the rotation is in the negative x direction. And then uh, we square that and we can plug that, uh, we can expand that out and plug that into our kinetic energy expression. All right, so now we can proceed to, um, uh, to match this to the standard form. And um, if we go back to the slides here, the standard form for a two degree of freedom system where we have one half times um, any of the generalized coordinates squared. So we'd have, the, we'd have this bar in this case. And then um, we'll have um, a, a single cross term in our case. All of, we don't have a third variable. So we'll have a single cross term, two and one, two, and then we don't have any, um, any of these terms either. So, um, so if we match there, um, we can see we need to decide which variable is which. So we let q1 equal x and q2 equal theta. So, um, so then this term and this term combine to give us m11 um, to get um, to get m22 well yeah well let's just go in order to get the coupling term we take we see the coupling term there so anything that multiplies that is going to give us our coupling term but we expect a one half factor out front and we expect a two so the only things we include are the m2, the positive or negative sign, and um, the L over 2. So all of that combines to give us the second term. And then last but not least, um, we, we look at the two theta double dot terms. So we get, um, we get these terms here combining to give us our m 2 Okay, so you see how we did that? We just had to look at the expression and match it, and we were able to come up with, um, we're able to come up with the 
all of the terms in the mass matrix. And we could plug these in to the equation of motion. It's going to have the form mq double dot plus kq equals q. So we can just plug those in, 1, 1, 1, 2. The 2, 1 is the same as the 1, 2, and then the 2, 2 term. So, um, so that's all we did. Oh, I forgot to mention um, a 1 fourth and what plus 1 twelfth. We know that. Well, that's just 1 third. And um, an interesting thing happens here. If you remember your dynamics, you might recognize as this as the inertia of a rod if it was rotating about its end. I think we used that on the pendulum example we did in class. So that looks familiar. And so seeing that, it's tempting to write the kinetic energy this way as um, the kinetic energy of bar what of the bar of the crawler and then um, write this as the velocity of point c and the inertia about point c right but if we did this notice that we would miss the coupling term that we got here this m12 term that term wouldn't show up if we'd use this equation so you have to remember to not be tempted into taking this shortcut because you'll miss terms and things come out wrong. And unless you're really good, you won't even notice that you've missed something unless you really kind of know what to expect with the dynamics. Okay, so we have the mass taken care of. Now let's take care of this spring. We're going to need um, delta dot VB minus VA and a unit vector from, from A to B. So um, to get the unit vector, we just draw a picture. Here's a triangle. If we had a length L there, then we'd have L cosine gamma on this side, L sine gamma on that side. So um, we just have a negative cosine gamma in the I, sine gamma in the J. Um, the velocity of the two points, it's kind of like what we've done. I don't think I need to go over that. So plugging all that in, we get delta dot we um, then just go ahead and erase the dots to get delta, um, plug that in, and we're all done. And in this form, we should be able to match and see that the, uh, the k, here's our generalized coordinate, q2. So anything that multiplies that that's not the 1 half um, will be, that's actually q2 squared. Um, anything that multiplies that that's not the one half is our k22 term. And we don't have anything with x or x times theta, so we know that k11 and k12 have to be zero. And so we can plug that in as well, and our stiffness matrix is all zeros except for that one term, k22. All right? So that's all we had to do. Oh, the power in gave us F over there. We've talked about that before, I think, as well. Um, so those are our equations of motion. Um, these are the equations that govern the system. We'll go and see um, a simulation in a second. At this point, though, I want to stop and talk about checking to see if these equations make sense. This is something that I'm going to ask you to do all the time on the exams. And the reason for that is that uh, if you want to be a worthwhile engineer, you don't just crunch through a procedure and give an answer. You should be able to tell someone whether or not your answer makes sense and what it means. And so this process allows us to think about what the answer means and whether it makes sense. So um, none of us, or at least I'm not smart enough to look at a big equation like this and to immediately tell you, yes, this is right, or no, it's not. Um, and you could also check the equation by going back through all the steps you made, but chances are you're not going to find mistakes that way. You're going to make the same mistake twice. So how do we check if they're reasonable? What we do is we try to come up with scenarios that would simplify the equation so that we can make sense of them. So one of them is, uh, suppose this bar was not allowed to rotate. Then this is just one single rigid body with a mass m1 plus m2, right? Then our equation of motion should just be f equals ma, or f equals m1 plus m2 times x1 double dot. And notice if we plug in theta equals 0, 
that kills this term, this top equation just becomes exactly that. The total mass times x double dot equals x. So um, that's the check that we would do there to verify that we've got the right equation, or to verify that this term's correct and that the forcing is pointed the right way. If we had a negative x, we'd know that something was wrong because looking up here, positive x should cause acceleration in the positive x. Okay, so um, we can do the same kind of thing by setting x equals zero and just looking at theta. If we do that, this becomes just a pendulum that can rotate about its pin that's fixed to ground. And we have a spring that's holding it up. We don't have any gravity stiffness that we're thinking about here. So this is like that example we did. And if we let x equals zero, we plug in the equations. Again, this all makes sense. It makes sense that this spring constant here should be positive because that would give us the meaning of a spring that's going to vibrate up and down and always want to return to equilibrium. If we got a negative stiffness here, that would be a, like a ball, um, a ball sitting on a hill where um, if we release the ball, it's not going to want to come back to equilibrium. It's going to fall off and run away forever. So, um, so that all makes sense, right? Um, actually, while we're on, the, on that, let's talk about the angle. Does cosine make sense? KL squared has the right units. It's K times, uh, K is um, a spring. Uh, then we need an L squared to get it to be a moment to be in this equation. And then the, the theta. Uh, so what about the angle? Um, cosine gamma. Well, if gamma is equal to zero, that spring will have the biggest possible effect. In that case, um, um, you know, the spring is perfectly in the direction that this bar is moving for small theta, right? So it makes sense that we should have the maximum effect. And indeed, cosine of zero is one. That'll give us the biggest possible effect that'll, um, our term becomes KL squared times one. So that's the biggest effect we can get. In contrast, if the gamma was 90 degrees, that we'd have to have the attachment point of the spring all the way down here. In that case, cosine of gamma is zero. And so we're gonna have a term KL squared times zero or basically the whole equation of motion is just gonna be one third ML squared theta double dot equals zero. This system won't have any vibration. It's just gonna, the whole, lo the whole rocket's just gonna fall over. So if you're the one designing the, um, the support system, you don't, want the, you don't want a spring like that. Um, okay, so those are really important to check. That, everything there then checks out. Um, another tricky one to check is the mass coupling term. And we get that by taking the top equation um, and then moving this term to the other side. And if we do that, we can rewrite that as we have down here. And um, now what we can do is we can imagine that um, we've pushed the bar so that it's accelerating in the positive direction. Positive theta means that the bar is falling over like this, right? So if there's nothing else happening on the system, no other force, if this falls to the left, what's the cart gonna do? Our intuition says that this bar falling to the left is gonna push on this point and wanna shove the cart to the right. So now we go and we see, does that make sense in the equation? Theta, according to the math, if theta double dot's positive, x double dot also has to be positive. And so that checks out. Uh, for some of you, it might make more sense to do the opposite, to say what, hap what would happen if I shove the cart to the right, which way will this bar fall? and you should be able to imagine or hold your pencil or something and you should be able to imagine that it's going to fall left. 
vice versa, right? If we push this to the right, if we applied a negative x double dot, the cart should fall over to this way. So, um, so again, you know, we're, if, if this is moving this way, what we're imagining, our intuition says, is that um, it's going to fall that way. So anyway, that stuff all makes sense. Um, does it make sense that there's no stiffness coupling, no off-diagonal term here? Well, yes, because if theta is equal to zero, nothing we can do with x will ever cause any compression in that spring. So it makes sense that that would only affect theta. And um, the force only affects the acceleration of x, right? If x is equal to zero, no amount of pushing here is ever going to cause anything to happen to the rocket, right? If, if x doesn't move, this force will just be absorbed by the ground. So that makes sense as well. All right, so those are the kinds of checks I want you to do and learn how to do uh, when you have equations of motion such as this. Um, if you have any questions, uh, bring them to class um, next time we meet. Let's um, just look at some simulations so we can see what happens. I'll show you um, the MATLAB code. Um, so um, again, calling ODE45 is as simple as defining what the initial conditions are. Here um, we have two states, x and theta. So we have x, x of 0, theta 0, x dot of 0, theta dot of 0. So we end up having a 4 by 1 state vector. Um, but then all we do is just tell OD45 where our equation of motion is. We want to integrate from 0 to 50 seconds in this case and give it the initial condition. The, all the work happens in the equation of motion. Here I just made up some parameters that are maybe relatively possibly correct for a, for a system like this. And um, uh, an angle gamma. And then I plug all of the equations in, M and K, and um, define what the force will be. And then now I can uh, plug those in um, to OD45. And I think we've talked in the past about the state vector x, you know, the top part is the displacements, the bottom part is the velocities, um, and how we put those equations into MATLAB. So anyway, um, we can run this. So first of all, I'll run it and we'll just look at the plot. So notice for this first case, the force is just a step. If time is greater than zero, the force is one. So um, just in case that's not clear. So the, yeah, actually we've talked about steps before, but the force versus time is a step function, right? So this is time t. All right. So if that's the case, what we get for the response, x is something that's zero and it slowly moves, uh, it slowly increases, and um, we're applying the force continuously, so with time we accelerate more and more and more. So that makes sense. Um, notice theta, um, initially we get a positive theta, which means kind of in, like in the check example that we've done earlier, initially the shuttle wants to fall down to the left, but eventually that spring takes over and it just oscillates back and forth. Um, a little easier way to visualize this is maybe to have MATLAB make a movie. So that's what I did here. So you can kind of see what happens. Once we apply that force and the cart starts moving, the whole, sh the whole rocket wants to fall over, but it's arrested by the spring and it's oscillating about a point that's tipped over a little bit. So that's, um, so that's what we see happening there, right? So that uh, makes physical sense. It looks like this is giving us the kind of motion that we want. And, um, you know, because we've done this kind of thing before, it's not such a mystery to you now. 
that if I apply the force as two steps and I time them just right, I might be able to get something interesting to happen. And indeed, if I just turn on the force halfway, wait a little bit, turn it on again, I can actually get this response with almost no vibration. So if we visualize that, um, we get the shuttle basically tipping back. The second pulse cancels the vibration and it travels smoothly, just deflected as much as it needs to be to ac account for the acceleration, the F equals MA acceleration that we're getting there. Um, I'll run that movie one more time so you can see it. Oops. Uh, let's try that one more time. So anyway, the the two the dynamics cancel, um, and we we could work out theoretically using superposition and things why the dynamics do that, and why the motion looks the way that it does. But um, we could do that using all the theory that we've learned in chapter two. So anyway, those are the simulations. That's how you can simulate that. And um, that concludes our example with this shuttle crawler. So um, when the actual one is driving to the pad, um, any little rocks that you hit can cause a lateral force, can cause the crawler to want to accelerate a little bit or slow down a little bit. So it's constantly being shaken. Um, all of that load is reacted again by stiffness down here where it's bolted down and then a lot of it comes through this uh, support post. And, um, and the, the actual rocket will want to tip back and forth, it'll want to move and so those who are designing it are trying to design it such that the springs that are holding it up, this tower, and that support arm are stiff enough and strong enough that it can do that without uh, damaging the rocket on its way to the pad. And by the way, um, other rockets, you know, the Atlas, um, they've all used similar kinds of launchers um, to drive them out to the pad. So this problem isn't unique to the uh, new space launch system. It's just the largest, most massive uh, rocket that we've built. So it's um, more difficult to get it to the pad without breaking anything. All right, well, thanks for tuning in and we will see you in class.